Fred Funk, on behalf of the PJ Tour and the Players' Championship, I want to welcome you to champion the JT Townsend story. JT was an inspiration to so many people on the First Coast, including my family. Despite JT's passing, his foundation continues to help others with disabilities get necessary equipment and resources. Please visit jttownsendfoundation.org to see how you can help as well. The PGA Tour and the Players Championship are honored to be able to bring this wonderful program to you. Get news 24-7 at firstcoastnews.com and on the First Coast News app. This is a First Coast News special presentation brought to you by the PGA Tour and the Players. I'm Casey DeSantis. For those of you who may have heard of him but never had the opportunity to meet him, you might know a little something about J.T. Townsend and his story. You might know in 2004 he was tragically hurt in that football accident, paralyzed from the neck down, never able to walk again. You might also know that he went on to graduate from high school, college, and start his own foundation. But what you might not know about J.T. Townsend is that he was an inspirational young man that changed lives here on the First Coast. J.T. Townsend inspired so many people, and he did so a lot of times by doing something so simple as smiling. After all, it was a smile that so many people were taken aback by when they met him for the first time. How could somebody be so happy, so optimistic after something so tragic? How could someone go strive to succeed, to live life to the fullest, to love as if nothing had ever happened? Through never before seen videos and never before told stories, we're gonna take you on a journey to learn more about JT Townsend, his friends, his family. We hope at the conclusion of this film that you will be forever changed just as much as those who knew him best say they were. I get pretty emotional when I talk about um, There I go. <laughs> Thought I'd get through this part. <laughs> Bless you, Lord. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. Yeah. Sort of like what they say, you know, when the lights were on, when it was time to make a big play, big time players make big time plays in big time games. That was JT. He just had some God gifted talent, his speed, his reflexes. Um, just his understanding of the game. And I mean, it was just instinct. You see that in, in athletes that really are superior to the other athletes that are on the field just because they have talents that are at a much higher level. And he exhibited every bit of that. JT was just a determined winner. Losing was not in his bag. He had his eye on um, Florida State. And I think it was already going to take him in because of his record and what he was receiving in. Because he could play quarterback, uh, defensive back, and linebacker, and wide receiver. He was a wide receiver. So I know he was, he was much a talent. Yeah, let's go. Run, run. Down, down. Got him, boys. Normally, um, you don't think something's wrong. But it just seemed like, because because that's not, that wasn't JT. I distinctly remember JT coming up to make a tackle. JT came on a a a, a, a bliss, you know, defensive bliss. He and my son was approaching the runner simultaneously, and JT being JT, that's you know all out. He actually beat my son to the tackle. And at that time, I didn't see him, but I felt all within me that that was JT. So when he didn't get immediately up, you, I mean, you began to worry. Um, I guess the way I can best express it is it was very obvious that something was wrong. 
and um, JT was always uh, getting up, uh, you know, responding to uh, to his plays. This time he didn't. And then by the time, you know, you really realized that oh, this may be a little bit more serious. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was a difficult night. Very difficult. And the only thing I remember just putting down the cam camera and then we ran across the field and um, they were trying to turn him over and and they were saying something about the breathing and they would tell him paramedic to get over here and and I just said, JT, just call on the name of Jesus. Call on the name of Jesus. Call on the name of Jesus. Her hands was raised to the sky, and I just seen her starting to pray. And then I knew something was serious when everybody just started running on the field. For me, it was just me and JT. He looked right up at me and kind of mouthed the words, I can't breathe, twice. And I told him, I know, it's okay, just relax. And within seconds, he, you could see this calm come over him, and I could tell that his chest wasn't rising, his arms weren't moving. I knew he had a high C-spine injury, so I asked for someone to go up in the stands and get my husband. I'm a pediatrician. I don't do airway management every day. I can do the orthopedic issues, um, and fortunately, my husband's an anesthesiologist, and he was in the stands and was able to come down and help. When I looked down at JT, I saw as if the angels had already been there. He had a calmness and a peace that uh, was so quiet and calm that you felt like, all right, things are gonna be all right. And I looked in his eyes and I said, I said, JT, uh, can you blow on my hand? And, you know, he didn't. I said, JT, now, you're not moving any air, and, uh, but we're going to take care of that. I'm going to move the air for you. With JT unable to breathe, um, he's an athlete. He was in great shape. So he had a good oxygen reserve. We had a good 9 to 12 minutes before I knew we'd be in trouble with his oxygenation ability. And I just chattered with him, unknown even now what I was saying, because it's not important what you're saying, it's just the tone of voice that you have, and just for him to know and be reassured that I'm there for him, and I'll take care of him. As things were moving very quickly, you know, the seriousness of JT being there and them trying to stabilize his, his uh, his uh, neck, um, the uh, next step was to uh, work with the ambulance drivers and where they would take JT. We really didn't think that JT was going to make it, and so the best place for him to go seemed to be to go to Wolfson Children's Hospital. We were asked if that would be all right, and of course, you know, the, the decision was made with the family to get him over there as quickly as possible. Uh, I learned later that the reason why they ask is because they didn't think the JT would survive. Uh, the responders felt that he would not make it. And uh, they, they called that, I hate to say this, uh, that it was a death ride, uh, that, they, that he could respond. When we got in the ambulance and it was just myself and the attendant in the back, and I said, you want to hook this ambu bag up to some oxygen right now? And he goes, we don't carry oxygen. I said, okay. You don't make a big deal out of it because, you, you know, that's like the spice on the cake. He's doing fine and you don't get excited because you don't want to change, you know, JT's situation. Only thing I want to know where you're taking them. Can I get in the car with you? And um, I had the girls, I didn't know how the girls, if I would, went with the m, &M how would the girls get home and whatnot, right? So, um, Coach Brown, Coach Brown came to me and he said, I got the girls, go. All I could think about 
was Carmen, it was Towns and, and the girl. Uh, all I could think about was uh, I begged Miss Towns to let JT come to Pittsburgh. All I could think about was to, no matter everything that I've ever had has to JT and Miss Towns, it was always not a problem coach. So that particular night, it, that's all. Um, oh, the day is February the 7th, 1996. This is the birthday boy. He is how old? How old are you? Me? No, you. See, I mean six. JT, don't play with me, boy. <laughs> Huh? Nine years old. See how he do his clothes. It's all right. Now. She was everywhere with the camera. And a lot of times we would be like, oh, mom, you really got to record this. You really got to record that. But when we're home looking at the home videos, it's like, oh, my gosh. You can, you can see that we were, we were really happy and we were just carefree. Nine years old. And we are getting ready to go where? To church. Yay! Where's your watch you got for your birthday? See, let me see the watch. That's his birthday present, nine years old watch. My mom always made sure on every birthday that we had a cake. This right here is the cake. One, two, three. That was so much fun because once the cake was done, there was no icing. It was just cake. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, okay, well, we'll just eat that. We're gonna put it together and make one big cake. This is the before the cake. I'll bring you back after the icing. Mom, I want to see it. Happy birthday to JT. I love you, Riddle. I love you, Riddle. That's something we always try to build on family. And sometimes I used to tell me, you ain't got nothing else, you got each other. And I always wanted them to be close knit. I always wanted them to look after each other and to just love on each other. And they did that. They did. A big hug, that's it. Happy birthday, JT. You got the watch, do you in the watch? I asked God for my three babies. And God blessed me with my three babies. And I was going to be the best mother that I ever could be. And I wanted them to also get the training that when they become mothers and fathers, that they can be the best that they can be. Did you lick that cake? Huh? Don't die. Did you lick that icing off that cake? Well, what, the, what mama said, don't lie to mama. And I always try to put God first. When the kids was smaller, I always tried to instill in them the love of Jesus. And everything can come and go, but at the end of the day, it's just Jesus. And like, it's okay to celebrate and do your thing, but also remember God, put God first in your life. And even if we did do this little party, now we still going to church, you know. I think they got enjoyment out of going to church as well. Look like I spotted him out there. That is the birthday boy. He is outside. When he out there playing, I was, I was glad. I was happy for him because he had a chance to to mingle with other boys, you know, just by hey, having two sisters and sometimes he would get rough with the girls. So I figured you need some boys, you know. So when they was in the front yard playing, and it's almost like a security, you know, you can go out there and you can look and see them and, you know, doing different things and then you can kind of like protect them. I don't think y'all should do that, you know. Why y'all have to hit so hard, you know, but don't break nobody's windows, but. It was, it was nice seeing all the little boys. And it, it also made me feel like our house, our home was like a safety home. This is what the birthday boy doing his birthday. Hey, birthday boy! This is the 
this is what the birthday boy do on his birthday. Play football with other people in my yard. Hey, hey, what, what gives him the right to be in my yard? Huh? Huh? Why in my yard? This is the party. This is the football yard. JT been persistent by asking me, can he play ball, can he play ball? And I know, JT, you pray about it, no, JT. And then this particular time I gave in and I said, come on, I'm gonna take you around there. So I went and I talked with Coach Brown and some of the other coaches and um, I asked him about him being on his team. So I was like, wow, we got 17, he'll make 18. I, and the season had already started. I said, she said, it doesn't matter. I'll bring him to practice every day, uh, just so long as he gets to, you know, just to interact and participate. So I said, okay. So as you know, he came to practice diligently with no guarantee of getting a uniform, no guarantee of even playing. But he showed up early, stayed late. And you know, several weeks in, me and the other coaches look at each other and we go, wow, we gotta get this kid a uniform. We gotta get this kid a chance to play. He was adopted on the team, and it's been a change in his life and our life ever since. At first, JT didn't get the hang of it. And when um, all the little players made the all-star team, JT didn't make it. So JT was, and JT is always determined to do what he have to do. So. The next year, um, when they played the all and when they picked the all-star players, JT was the last player they picked, but he made the all-star team. After that, he went on to excel in sports. He was good in basketball. Four, five, he was good in baseball. And he was good in football. I always wanted him to be a quarterback, but JT, he decided he wanted to hit people. And JT could hit, because when uh, when he was real small, me and him, we used to wrestle a lot in the house, and I those. And I used to take him down, right? But the kids started growing on me, and by the time he was about 15, he might have been about 6'1 or 6'2. And you see my height. And boy, I had to try to use other techniques, or I had to start biting him, pitching him, anything just to get him off him. You know, whatever the sport, whether it was baseball, which was the first sport he played, to football, to basketball, he excelled at a high level. And not only did he excel at a high level, uh, he made the people around him better. So it wasn't just about the sports to him. He was just a genuinely good guy. When I got there and um, they were talking about what had happened, um, I just called some prayer warriors and we were all in prayer. And I remember sitting in this little room and it was a, some more of the parents, um, people from Episcopal, and we just started praying. And at that point, I really believe that all of us felt confident and comfortable with where we were and that whatever happened, it would be for the best and that it was not in our hands, it was in, it was in a higher being's hands. JT was so alive, that was the miracle. And um, the fact that he, that in spite of this length of time and, and what had happened and we didn't really know exactly what the injury was, they was going to transfer him over to Shan. Um, and he woke up and he said um, he couldn't move. 
And I told him, I said, well, we're just going to just wait and we're just going to believe in God. And you just keep praying. I even remember, I believe, going to his ear like, JT, you can't leave me. You can't leave me. Not right now. He looked at me and just said, you know, it's... It's better than JT not survive. That young man on the field had a burning desire to live. What about the outpouring of support of people who started coming from the community to the hospital? Oh my God. Oh my God. God, I think that everybody seemed like was in the world was there. <laughs> you know, that's a lot of people to stay, right? But it was, it was so awesome, you know. From day one, um, it was so many people out to the hospital. Um, the kids at Episcopal was so amazing. They were there from time visiting hours started until visiting hours was over and it was it was they were lining up in the hallway and the parents they came out from seven o'clock in the morning to basically ten o'clock at night it was always a room full of people the next morning of course we, we went there and JT you know waking up and he's got this halo on his head and as Don said a big smile you know, and I mean, he was alive. And he um, just knew that he was going to be all right. And when he when he came through that point, we knew things were going to we were going to make things the best we could for JT. But he clearly couldn't stay at Chan's because there wasn't the the rehab that was needed there once his once his neck was stabilized. And we talked about, okay, so where are the choices? What what choices are here for for JT where he can get the best care? And it was either going to Miami or it was going to Shepherd Center. And thank God for Shepherd and the trainer. Thank God for Shepherd and the trainer, which just really changed his life in terms of the type of rehab that he had and how all of the things that um, Pat and Carmen learned about his care. I mean, Pat and Carmen were like warriors. You know, they learned exactly how to take care of him. And we, we went up there and visited him and you had a gown, mask, glove, and just everything they did was the perfect way to take care of him and to get him in the exactly right wheelchair and all of the rehab that he needed. But I think the most elated thing to us was when we got, we went to the Shepherd Center in Atlanta and whatever they did, it made him where he could talk. Shepherd was the first time I heard his voice. And the first word came out of his mouth, I don't know, it was mama. You know, and then dad, and, and that was the first time we heard a sound from him in what, maybe a few months. And at that time, he started learning different things about until he walked, how to survive, how to, you know, to write, to use a computer, how to communicate for as someone taking care of him. And after then, and we knew we could do it. Um, the biggest hurdle was over with. It was okay. It was okay. It was like, you can breathe now, you know? You can breathe. You know, someone came up to me after the event and made the comment that if you knew JT was hurt so significantly, why did you save his life? My response was, I, I'm not a judge. That's not my job. And I was, we were gonna do our best to make sure that that happened for him. That young man on the field had a burning desire to live. <laughs> that was not my call. We're going back to school. We're going back to school. We gotta be there in a little while. How you feel, JT? Oh, 
You ain't be late. Don't say you gonna be late. <laughs> oh my God. We was waiting and we was waiting to go back to El Pesto. And when they gave us the final words that he can come. Oh, of course, something happened to the van or we was running late. <laughs> that was one of the most scariest days for us because we had been with him basically every day since this happened. And now it's like he's going out. You know, you got to let him go. Hurry him. <laughs> Are you good? Good. Come back, buddy. It was so awesome. It was so awesome. The student, the faculty, the staff. I'm taking notes for JT. Um, but he loved life. So he went out there every day. Doesn't matter if the nurse didn't come or whatnot. He might woke up on the wrong side of bed that day. Doesn't matter, he's going to school. High school graduation. Walk me through that day. <laughs> High school graduation. <sighs> I think everyone there was crying. They called his name. Mr. Zimmer walked over there and gave him his diploma. Oh my God. My heart was so filled. In spite of everything he went through, in spite of everything that they said, he wasn't accomplished. He had his mindset, he had determination, he had faith. He was gonna get that diploma. And he had mama riding him. You know, we gonna get that education. It's not just gonna stop on high school. In my 50 years, this is probably the strongest, most courageous, most self-effacing young man that I've ever known. And he always loved jelly beans. It was a July day and it was smoking hot. And he lived over there by the stadium, by Jag Stadium. and. Um, the house was probably 102 inside. He had a thermometer actually in his bedroom and it was about 98 degrees in there. Had this window air conditioner that was trying to make up for it, but it wouldn't. And we walked in the house and it was basically a shack. And um, it, it, it was depressing. That alone was somewhat depressing. But when I walked in the room, JT was sitting in his wheelchair and he had this unbelievable smile, just lit up the room. And it was so uplifting. You know, I went in there to lift him up, and he lifted me up. He came home, and he was totally changed in a lot of ways and said, this young man is incredible, and we've got to do something for him. Fred called Tommy, my husband, on the telephone one day and said, I have met this young man, and he has just made such an impression on me, and I want to help him. We ended up saying we're going to build him a house and at least get him in an environment where he can be with his family and be in a healthy environment and the house is built for him and his disability so he can have as many comforts as he can possibly have. For them to say we'll be your house, how often do somebody say we'll be your house? And it's like, I felt then the wheel was turning our life will be better. And um, our piece of the puzzle was to fill the house. And uh, we thought the best way to go about this is to involve the community. Um, I went online and I, I contacted media and we created a registry at Bed Bath & Beyond and Target and started filling this registry with VCRs and pots and pans and different things that anyone would need in a, in a new home. As soon as I would go back to the website or the registries to see what was happening, I, I couldn't believe it. 
the community just embraced this. Their generosity was overwhelming. I would actually input something, and the minute I input it, it said complete. Man, I'm telling you, it was unbelievable. We, we would come over and come by and see the guys putting the house together, you know, but you don't know how it's gonna come out. And when the day came that we came here and walked through that door, first thing I, was, I said, well, oh my God, this is out of sight, you know? <laughs> this is really good. And then it was so roomy for every, because what I liked what they did is the way they built it for JT to have access to everything and be able to get around like he wanted to get around. It's built especially for him, you know? And then the girls, they finally got their own room because when we was had at our old house, the girls had to sleep together. Then they both had their own space. They loved that too. <laughs> and we got ready to move in. He was so uh, he was so excited. He wanted to put on his shades so nobody could see his eyes. But they wouldn't let us come in with shades though. They they said no shades. And um, and looking at him, you could tell when he's excited about something. You could see it all in his eyes, and and he got this little funny smile. Then, right, you know, he smiles straight when it's normal, but when he's he's thrilled, his, his smile go kind of funny. And I'm looking at him, and I was looking at him smiling and everything, right? And he was so excited. He was so happy about it, right? We did it, and it was a community effort. I asked the community um, uh, to rally around JT one time. I said, we, we need to do this one time. I'm not asking you to do this on an annual basis. It's gonna be a one-time deal, and we had a huge golf tournament. We had a lot of sponsors. We had a, the PGA Tour rallied around them. Um, so many facets came to, together. Everyone wanted to be a part of it. Everyone wanted to help. No one wanted, anything but just to help this young man to have this beautiful home to walk in and of course we cried as we went through every room because it just it's beautiful and he had him a house and that was one of the happiest days of my life how do you tell a man how do you tell a funk family thank you you know thank you it just seemed like it's just not enough Thank you for how you put my family together. Thank you for how you changed our life. Thank you for how you gave my son a chance. JT was never a kid that liked to stay in the house because before he had his incident, he would always be away from the house. Well, well for my my aspect, it was we wanted to do, we called them morale trips for him. Oh, you okay? No, his head. <laughs> and we tried to come up with things that we could do reasonably easy, and nothing's easy, but reasonably easy so he could kind of get out and see things and do things that he wanted to do. So JT riding all around out by the tennis courts and the pool and stuff, and we had some fun at the White House. It meant everything. The him being in that chair, there were no limitations. There, the, he was no different than the next person. He still was gonna live life to the fullest. It, it meant the world to him to still continue to live. It meant the world to his family for him to continue to live. He was never a victim to anything. He was always victorious. That just instilling him that he can go anywhere. He might not go to the beach, not yet. It's open. The world was open to him. Diamond. Diamond was given to JT on his 21st birthday from um, the Funk family. You know, they my family, my backbone, my rock. Diamond, sit down. And Diamond has been 
and is a part of our life. She, she makes us happy. And I always, from day really one, when you first got it, she just nuggled in JT lap, right? And when the girls being a little naughty to her, she used to run in his room. And she used to jump in his bed and like he was gonna protect her from the world. And him and Diamond B, JT and Diamond became good friends. Why you doing, man? She bite my nose, that's your hurt. I don't feel a thing. Diamond, Diamond, Diamond like to chase a lizard. So he would go outside and help her chase lizard. <laughs> You and that graduation. I think you can only get like a certain amount of tickets. Of course, there was more of us there. I remember the excitement uh, of him being in his cap and gown, and uh, when he had tried it on, and and um, oh wow, just uh. Mm. I don't know, I was just, I was just bubbling over it inside. You know how you want to holler and just go, yes, yes, yes. I wanted to just, yes, you know. I was actually with him where the graduation, the graduates go in, and I was like, ooh, you nervous, you nervous. And he's like, shut up, shut up, you're going to make me nervous, you're going to make me nervous. And I'm like, oh, this is so exciting. Jerry Townsend Jr. And the whole room, like the whole arena just goes crazy. I went crazy. We're all crying and oh my gosh, like screaming. So it was awesome. And the standing ovation lasted for a long time. Since my brother got sent an ovation, he let it ride. He went all around the whole auditorium just to get back in his one spot. I was like, JC, you ain't supposed to do that. I was like, he was like, I had to stand an ovation. I had to just let it sound out a little bit, so. It came to the point that he wanted to start making a difference. He wanted to pay back. He had such a huge heart, and that was what his dream really was, was to give back to the community that helped him, pay it forward. So we were sitting around one night, and, and Tom said, I can envision a, a foundation, JT. What do you think about that? He goes, yeah, yeah, I like that idea. I can envision a building with your name on the top of it. Yeah, yeah, I can envision that. And um, more importantly, he knew that that foundation would be able to help people like himself who find themselves in a situation where insurance denies them or, you know, they can use a, a piece of adaptive equipment that is so costly and they don't have any possible means of, of getting that piece of equipment. That equipment can change their lives. And JT knew that firsthand. I know, I know what it means to have hope. You don't know where it's coming from. You don't know what's going to happen, but you need somebody to step in and help. I know that experience and he know it as well. And to be able to go and change someone's life, to make a difference, to give them my hope, that little piece of equipment that you may think mean nothing, but yet to that recipient or to that caregiver, it's the world. It's been a complete blessing. Um, just that activity chair alone and knowing the things that they do for other people and the things that um, 
that Levon requires and just to know that they helped in such a great way, it means everything to us. And to know that the foundation will be doing something like that, will be doing just what we receive, will be making a difference in somebody's life, that's awesome. That's awesome. Oh my God, I was like, oh, words can't even explain it. I mean, it was so amazing. And I just ran out the room and went in the other room, and just held my head down and, and cried and thanked God. I knew, I knew then we was on the, we was on our way. New special presentation has been brought to you by the PGA Tour and the players. Physical therapy, it was a part of life. So when the doctor had done told him that he wasn't going to walk, and I said, JT, just because the doctor said, that don't mean it have to be so. God got the last word. <laughs> He always believed that he would walk again. Always. Always. There was never a doubt in his mind. With him, it was always when, never if, about everything in his life. Always when. When I walk again. When I get married. When, when, when. When I get my first job. When I get your car from you. He wanted my car. He was never down. And I had dealt with so many patients in the past that wouldn't even want to get up. There was never a day that JT Townsend wasn't going to get up out of bed. I remember driving down the street and I was saying, Townsend, what? All of these things that are going on, all of these things that are happening, these wonderful things in your life, isn't it just awesome? You know, just the people, the things. And he said, T, I would give up everything just to have my legs back because none of that matters. Well, you pull it, hey. you pull it way down. Hey, hey, you. It was in Cleveland and we was uh, in the hotel. Hey. He was lying in bed and all of a sudden, my mom started screaming. <laughs> oh my God, I was like, <laughs> oh, words can't even explain it. I mean, it was so amazing. I know I keep saying the word amazing, but it was like, it was just so amazing. And then all I saw was JT put his arms up. I mean, the whole room, everybody just boohoo crying, boohoo crying. And I think this was one of the first time he did it because I was like, oh my God, you gotta show daddy. My daddy wasn't in the room. I think he just stepped out of the room for a second. I think it might have been Carmen who said, Jerry, come here, come here. And she said, just stand right there and uh, watch something like that, she said. And, and JT said, look, daddy. And he moved his arm. And my daddy just, like, I've never seen my daddy really, really cry. And I just ran out the room and went in the other room. And just held my head down and, and cried and thanked to God. I knew I knew then we was on the we was on our way. <laughs> yes, Lord. To me, it like was almost like I told you I'm gonna be walking. 
I'm, I told you, it's coming. You know, the way he looked, mm -hmm. yeah, baby, it's coming, and it's so. I always was looking forward to that day that he would be walking. I was just like, oh my God, it's gonna just be a matter of time when JC just fool us all and just get up and walk. Just get up that chair and just walk around the room like the incident never happened. They said he wouldn't be here to do it. Look at him, look at him. And you know, you should have seen your face. You just, and he just laughing at me, right? But it was really amazing. And when he moved the toes, <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. The day everybody had was June the 5th. But our day started June the 4th. Um, maybe about sometime after 11 o'clock. The nurse came in by 11 o'clock. When the nurse came in, I used to go to my room. I asked him, you okay? You need anything? Okay, if not, I'll see you in the morning. I went in my room and the girls came. It seemed like it was yesterday. They came running in the room and they said, Mama, JT not responding. What you mean he's not responding? Of course I go in there. I said, all right, buddy, you gotta wake up. You gotta wake up. Come on, buddy. The girls start screaming and crying. And I told Sunshine to call 911. I told Precious she need to pray. Um, the nurse and I, um, after calling 911, got him out of the chair, laid him on the floor. We started doing compressing, CPR. Um, we worked there until the emergency service came. When they came, only thing I could think about, don't give up on my baby. Don't give up on my baby. Um, they was mostly trying to keep me away. Asked me about different medicine, different history and all that. And I still was saying, JT, call on Jesus. JT, call on Jesus. <laughs> Anything I know, they left. I couldn't ride in a <laughs> truck with them. We got to the hospital. First they put us in this room. This room looks so familiar. <laughs> they put us in this room. Then the doctor came. When the doctor came, it's, you know, you just felt like something wasn't right. It wasn't the same. You know. They told me I wanted to see my baby. I wanted to see my baby. And he said, um, the heart stopped. When I went back there to see him, the, um, the paramedic was still doing chest compression. Stop. I felt like my world changed again. I felt like my friend, my number one son, he was gone. It was
JT was love. JT was love personified in every fiber of his being. He figured it out. So many people don't, you know, but he, he figured it out in a, in a way that is um, an inspiration to so many of us. And uh, it's not how long you're here, it's what you do with that time while you're here. And he, and he proved it to us. I mean, he did a lot for this community, he did a lot for his family, he did a lot for his friends. And I'll never, I'll never, um, can never thank him enough for that. I hope people will take away that um, family is so important, relationships are so important. And that is one thing JT Townsend treasured, people and relationships. Yes, he loved this beautiful home and was so grateful, but really not for himself, for his family. He wanted to take care of his sisters and his mother and his father. I mean, that was what he wanted. He wasn't selfish. He was selfless. Oh, man, if I got into saying what I want to say next, I'll never get through it. Um, what's really neat is that the, the foundation continues to live and the legacy of JT uh, lives through that foundation. And um, I think that's really cool. The foundation was really important to him because he loved to give. He was one of the most giving people that I have ever met in my life. I know the, the start of the foundation was really important for him because he received such an outpour of support, such an outpour of love from the community, uh, some of the community that he didn't even know, that he had never met. And these people came from everywhere to show so much love and support. And he knew that he could never repay that back, so he wanted to pay it forward. And I think he did that, and I think he continues to do so. JT didn't have the money, financial wherewithal to do what he really wanted to do. But he found a way. He found a way. A lot of decisions I have to make in life, I sit back and say, what would JT do? You know, what would JT do? We can honor JT, his memory, by keeping his legacy alive by keeping his foundation going. And it's hard, it's tough, uh, but it's something I'm committed to and I hope others will join me and do the same. I would love for the foundation to live on, you know, everyone out there, come help the JT Townsend Foundation. You know, come help us change the world. Come up, help us make people life better. Hmm? Feel that awesome feeling I'm feeling. <laughs>
is a whore. And I love you, Mom and Dad, very, very much. And I thank you for putting me with a really, really good teacher. Thank you. That is a very nice card. No, he didn't think he was going to walk. He think he was going to run. <laughs> As the players, we believe that together anything is possible, which is why I've been volunteering for more than 15 years. Last year, we generated $8.1 million for local charities, like Dreams Come True, which grants wishes for children with serious illnesses, Angelwood, a program for adults and children with developmental disabilities, and Canines for Warriors, which empowers and improves the lives of our veterans.